Hello and welcome to New England Authors. So good to have you. We record here in Cambridge and broadcast on stations throughout New England. We try to bring great ideas and we have a very interesting uh, guest today, Lee McIntyre. Welcome, Lee. So Thank good you very to have much. you. Thank you. Uh, you're the research fellow for the Center of Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University. And his book here is called Post Truth, which is uh, a new uh, term, and we're going to ask you to explain it. And it's part of the MIT Essential Knowledge series and was just, just published. So uh, did you write this book in response to the election of 2016? Uh, I, I did more or less. The, uh, the important thing to remember is that the uh, Oxford English Dictionaries named post-truth their word of the year two weeks before the election. Uh, had occurred, yeah. but I have to say that it was after the election that I got the idea uh, to do the book. So tell us, what is post-truth? So the, uh, the Oxford Dictionaries defines post-truth as a situation where our beliefs are structured more around feelings and opinions than they are around facts and evidence. Uh, that's the, the dictionary definition. My charge in the book was to write about uh, what else folks needed to know about it. And I think that there is more of a political angle to it uh, uh -huh. there, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary is correct, but what I don't want to be lost is the idea that uh, post-truth is uh, meant to manipulate someone's political reality. Right. Well, um, uh, to me, this isn't anything new. People have, uh, politicians have been lying, uh, leaders have been lying since the, before the Roman Empire, right. uh, probably. I studied a, a little bit about the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that there was a lot of um, lying, uh, deception. I grew up in the Vietnam era, and there was a lot of lying, not just about the Gulf of Tonkin, but how many casualties were, were taking place. The Iraq War, as we know, uh, was based on a lot of lies. What's different? So uh, it's, it's a good question. I, I think of post-truth as an umbrella term. It can cover lying, it can cover political spin, other sorts of things. But really the important thing to remember about post-truth is that it's not just lying, it's the idea that uh, we can lie without consequence. It's ah. the idea that people can say untrue things or ignore facts or pretend that things that happened really didn't happen and get away with it because uh, seemingly, I don't want to say no one cares because there are plenty of people who care, but if they're not accountable for the lie, I think that that's uh, really a, a better definition of post-truth than to, to say that it's merely lying. Though you're right, uh, lying's been around for a long time. I think maybe even post-truth has been around for a long time. So you use um, some key uh, psychological concepts. Can you uh, expand on what uh, of these sure. psychological concepts you're talking about? Yeah, um, in the book I talk about uh, cognitive bias. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a terrific book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. I mean, he talks about all sorts of uh, bi cognitive biases there. Cognitive biases are uh, built-in shortcuts in the brain that can feel a lot like thinking, but they're not actually thinking. Right. And they lead us to a conclusion whether we're justified or not. Uh, one that I talk about in the book is confirmation bias which is when you already know what you want to believe, right. and you go out and you shop for facts to back up to ba what you already believe. We all do this. We, we, we do. It's, it, well, it's wired in, right? It's, uh, it's, it's wired into us. Um, another uh, interesting cognitive bias that's wired into all of us that I think is a, one of the precursors to post-truth uh, is the, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's sometimes colloquially called the uh, too stupid to know they're stupid effect. Um, and the, 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 it, it, that idea won an, an ignoble prize. <laughs> yeah, is um, that right? The um, idea behind the Dunning-Kruger effect is, but it's an important effect, and the idea behind it is that people who are incompetent lack the skill to understand that they're incompetent. So that when they're trying to assess whether, so apply it in this context, if somebody's trying to assess whether or not they know something, uh, whether or not they're skilled enough to understand what the facts are to justify their belief. If they really don't understand, they don't understand. And mm. they might think that they know something that they don't actually know. So, so it's yeah. uh, fa false knowledge is a bigger danger uh, here than anything. 
Good, good. You bring up some, uh, one other one. I don't. I didn't think you mentioned it. It's um, that in, in, for a dictatorship to thrive, people have to think that they're acting on their own free will. Yes, uh, that that idea uh, comes down to is through uh, through history. Um, I think that the idea here is supposed to be that if you can actually convince somebody that what you're saying is true, um, or even that they're not even going to look for evidence, they're just going to believe that what you, you say is true, then you've really got them. Um, dictators don't have to have that. Dictators can control your reality in other ways. If you think about um, propaganda, if you think about authoritarian governments, I mean, one way to control the population is to get them to agree with you, to get them to believe what you want them to believe. You don't absolutely, that's the easy way. Yeah. The harder way is just to get them to comply in their behavior. And so you really don't have to get them to believe it. Uh, Jason Stanley wrote a book called How Propaganda Works. And he makes the point in his book that propaganda isn't meant to convince you, it's meant to show you who's boss. So it's really, it's nice if propaganda can convince someone and then the ruler has no trouble. But even if it doesn't convince someone, if you can just show that I can lie and get away with it and there's nothing that you can do about it, then you're dominating their reality. Mm. So propaganda comes from the word to propagate and it's not a bad, it wasn't a bad word. In fact, mm -hmm. in, in Spanish it's used as to, to advertise. Right. Um, but, you're, but now we, are, you, we use it very differently. And mm -hmm. the, the thing uh, that really interested me is you talk a lot about Fox News and mm -hmm. Rush Limbaugh. Uh, you're not too kind to Fox right. News. <laughs> uh, could you elaborate? Uh, where did Fox News come from? Why are you so uh, down on them? Well, the, the, the thing that, um, look, there's, there's always been uh, allegations of bias. There's always been concern about partisanship. And I think that the question that uh, has to uh, arise is someone's intent. Um, is a news outlet obeying the good journalistic practices of uh, fact-checking, uh, uh, double, uh, double sourcing uh, ideas, of, uh, disclosing conflicts of interest? So they're, they're not maybe the only partisan news outlet, but the question that always comes up for me with Fox is, uh, what's their intent? Is their intent that they actually discover facts and then present them? Or is the idea that they are, is it confirmation bias? Do they already know what they want their point of view to be and then they, uh, they present it in that way? And so I guess it, it, going back to what you said about propaganda, uh, maybe you prefer the word disinformation. Uh, and that, that, I think, is some of what happens with, uh, with Fox News. There was actually a study done uh, not long ago which found that people who watched Fox News were uh, more poorly informed than people who didn't watch any news at all. Yes, I read that in your... Right. <laughs> in your right. Yeah. And, and so the idea there is that, uh, and this idea goes back to Socrates, false knowledge is worse than ignorance because if somebody has a false belief, then they think they already know the truth. If they're ignorant, then maybe they can be taught. And so ideology, uh, the extent to which you're trying to uh, tell somebody something that you want them to believe is true, whether you believe it or not, by the way, right? So somebody could maybe be disingenuous. Maybe some of the commentators, the opinion commentators on Fox don't really believe what they're saying, but if their goal is to get their audience to believe it, or just, as I said, to dominate their reality, uh, in a way, then I think that's a very bad thing. Mm. So you also um, said that uh, Fox News has a tremendous reach. I don't know, uh, did you mention how many people watch Fox News or get their, their information I, from I Fox don't News? Have, I don't have that information on it's, the, the it's tip of my tongue, high. but it, 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 is, it is high. I think they're the number one rated uh, cable network. Um, but but I, I don't know the exact viewership and numbers. Might be in the book, but I don't remember. But I think uh, you mentioned how much money they make compared to uh, C yep. CBS. Well, could you talk about that? Yeah, uh, there during the uh, election cycle. Um, now CNN also made uh, quite a bit of money, and, and this is one beef that people have that uh, what CNN would do is that they would just run Trump rallies live with no interruption, no uh, commentary on it, because then people would turn to the channel and they would make a lot of money. And the, the number that I remember was a billion dollars, that, that they made a billion dollars profit uh, in, in mm -hmm. the year, and I think Fox News made 1.3 billion. So that's, that's an awful lot of money. 
Yeah. So um, the, you also mentioned that the media outlets gave Trump five billion dollars in free advertising. You, you estimate in the form of uh, news that. Um, uh, so you'd have to agree that he was pretty pretty shrewd about this. Oh, pretty, he was. Yeah, pretty he, successful he, in doing he was. this. He and, he understands how media works. Uh, he understood. He's. He, uh, he understood what uh, showmanship is and how to hold an audience. And I think that, um, you know, if you think about CNN at the time, uh, why were they so riveted to the coverage? Why did they want to run the rallies live? It's because they were making money from it. Their, their viewers liked it. There were some criticisms later um, over whether they did a bad thing by doing this. And there were some mea culpas from uh, Jeff Zucker and, uh, and others. Uh, at the network at the time wondering, you know, did, did we do the wrong thing in this? Because to the extent that um, running a political event in which someone isn't telling the truth uh, and a news organization is not correcting it, but just running it live, uh, that's, that is promoting disinformation. We have a great guest here, Lee uh, McIntyre, and we're talking about the book Post Truth. You also wrote another book um, uh, called Respecting Truth, Willful Ignorance in the Digital Age. Mm -hmm. uh, you're really interested in truth, aren't you? Uh, uh, I am. <laughs> uh, one book led to the other is what happened. Oh, I, see. I, was, uh, I was very happily uh, interested in the problem of science denial. Uh, I was interested yes. in how... Uh, how it is that people can look at the facts about climate change, evolution by natural selection, uh, the, whether vaccines cause autism, all of those sorts of questions. And respecting truth was about that. Respecting mm -hmm. truth was out, about what was wrong with people who rejected scientific facts that they didn't like. Uh, the problem is that science denial is became one of the main roots of post-truth. And the problem sort of metastasized from just science denial to fact denial. Next thing you know, people were denying facts about uh, the size of uh, the uh, Trump's inauguration uh, or disinformation about uh, there, there were uh, many sites uh, on the Internet. And Trump also made the claim that he actually won the popular vote when he didn't. Mm -hmm. So those are those end up being problematic. Um, one because I was interested in science denial, it seemed a, a natural thing to then move over to uh, to post truth. Now, speaking of silent, science denial, you talk about the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. um, they were they were they spearheaded science denial. Uh, would you say that? Uh, I would say science denial has been around for a long time. Uh, Galileo, Galileo. And before, <laughs> but um, what happened with the tobacco lobby? in the 1950s is that there was, um, there was a study that was going to be published, which uh, a scientific study that linked cigarette smoking to cancer. And the response of the tobacco companies was to get together. They invited a, a public relations person and they thought about what their response was going to be. And the response that the public relations person gave them was, you've got to fight this with your own scientists. You've got to hire your own scientists, uh, you know, uh, fight the data and get your story out there. So they bought full page ads to try to muddy the water, to try to create doubt where there wasn't any. Uh, that history is well told in uh, Naomi Oreska's book, Merchants of Doubt. Yes. And she calls that the tobacco strategy. Interesting thing, and that was in the 50s. Interesting thing happened with the tobacco strategy. It became the go-to strategy for science deniers on acid rain, the ozone hole, uh, climate change. It's uh, in some cases that it was uh, even some of the same people uh, and some of the same uh, source of money for this. So it was an interesting. Um, she tells that story very, very well, uh, along with her co-author Eric Conway in her book. I tell a little piece of it uh, in Post Truth, just to lay the marker that hardcore science denial, partisan science denial. Um, not just from a commercial interest, but then evolving over into a political interest, started in the 1950s and then sort of culminated with climate change and then made the leap to post-truth. So what's the, what's the uh, um, uh, post-truth of climate change? What's the strategy of people who deny climate change? They, um, they have their, an alternative set of facts? Uh, 
The, the interesting thing about that, uh, the, the interesting thing about uh, climate change denial is that they will sometimes use facts. They'll sometimes quote NASA data, but it's cherry picking. They'll mm -hmm. cherry pick facts that they, they want to use, which is a well-known tactic of conspiracy theorists. Uh, conspiracy theorists, some climate change deniers are conspiracy theorists. They'll claim that the world's uh, climate scientists are uh, all of uh, a particular political persuasion and they've all colluded somehow to pretend that the question of climate change is, is closed uh, when it's not. The problem with conspiracy theories is they, they paint themselves as skeptics. So they can talk a good game about how, well, they're really more scientific than the scientists. This question hasn't been proven yet. What you find with uh, conspiracy theorists is that they actually, they're, they're quite gullible. They'll believe data, they'll, they'll use They'll believe what they want to believe yes. on very little evidence. Yes. But if it's a claim that they don't want to believe, then no evidence will convince them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of where we are on climate change. How much data uh, do there need to be to prove to somebody that uh, climate change is real? I, I don't know if you know this, but the flat earth theory is back. Uh, there is a convention in Denver uh, um, coming up that is devoted to the, the uh, Flat Earth International Conference. So that data has been around for 500 years, but people deny it. I see, I see. Well, um, Flat Earth is um, not something that we can deny too, too easily, <laughs> but um, You'd be I, surprised. Think, uh, I think one of the problems with climate change is that it's, um, it doesn't really, we don't know what to do. And so we, we tried to do, do nothing because, yeah. Uh, yeah. And there was a very interesting article in the New York Times some, some time ago about um, how this uh, started in the 1980s with the, uh, the Republican administration that um, even Exxon Mobil was on board for climate change and then mm -hmm. um, um, they, they went off board because they, they didn't see any, any need to. Uh, do you know anything about that? Uh, or? It, it, it didn't used to be a partisan issue. Uh, George Bush the first it was famous for saying that he was going to fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. And it wasn't that many years ago that uh, Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich were sitting on a couch on TV talking about a bipartisan approach to, uh, to climate change. I think it really got politicized after the debacle with the uh, 2000 election and Al Gore uh, publishing his book and then it, it was uh, seen by folks on the right as a, uh, as a partisan issue. The problem with climate change is that it's, it's real and there really is not much, if any, uh, scientific uh, dissent on this problem, but it gets mixed up somehow with the values question. It gets mm. mixed up with the question of, well, what should we do about it? Uh, yeah. or, or do we want to do anything about it? If, if people didn't like the response to climate change because it was too expensive, then I think they should just say that. They should just say, we don't want to spend the money on it and we're not that worried about the next generation. But to then end up denying that it's true, uh, I think that's, uh, that's an, an easy move for someone to make. And don't forget that th this has really happened before. Look at the tobacco strategy. Right. What started out with a commercial interest became a political interest. Same thing happened with climate change. Uh, the interesting story about ExxonMobil is that all the while that they were denying climate change, uh, there are now leaked memos to show that they were making plans for how to uh, uh, look for new oil deposits uh, once the polar ice cap had melted. Mm -hmm. So they were talking out of both sides of their mouth yes, about it. Yes, yes, yes. Now, you mentioned uh, that news as we know it is a fairly recent uh, event in the last century or so. Uh, could you talk a little about that, mm -hmm. where, it, where it came from, uh, journalism? Yep. Because before that time, uh, if you read newspapers from the 1800s, they were very partisan. They, mm -hmm. were, they, they had no um, idea of uh, journalist standards as we know yeah. them. It, th mm -hmm. That was one of the most interesting pieces of research that I did. It was something that I, I really didn't know about until I did the, the research yeah. for the book. And what I found is that we're really sort of spoiled uh, in expecting over the last several decades that we would have 
objective news. If you look in the, the history of the world, there have been news sources that people understood that they weren't objective and they had to look in you know, several different places in order to find, use their brain to find out what was true. They didn't just expect to be able to read it in the New York Times and it was automatically true. The, the really fascinating part of this story that I found is that the, the very notion of objectivity in news was born from the Associated Press. And the idea was that there were all of these, uh, and, and this was 100 years ago, there were all of these newspapers which had their partisan points of view, but then once the telegraph was invented, they all had to have a source for the facts that they were then going to later spin. Oh, I see. And so the Associated Press had to figure out how to give as plain vanilla an idea of news as they could that then went out over the wire and then all the newspapers took it and spun it and did whatever they wanted to do. But that was really where the idea of objectivity in news came from, quite recent. How, how interesting. When, when did the uh, Associated Press f form? Um, mm. I, I don't remember the exact date, but it was uh, it was close to the uh, uh, beginning of the of the twentieth century, maybe a, a little bit, yeah. uh -huh. a little uh -huh. bit before that. I mean, and if you go back just before that to yellow journalism, the, the Hearst newspapers, right, they, right. things were pretty bad. Yes, and it was it was about that period. I think a little bit after that, more around uh, nineteen ten or so. I'd, I'd have to take a look at my book to remind myself of the date. But uh, that, that's about when it happened. But now uh, objective journalism is falling by the wayside. Would you agree with that? You have a, you have yeah. a, you have a um, statistic that 44% of Americans get their news from Facebook, for example, which is not yeah. an objective <laughs> source of news. Um, it, it's, it's not that there isn't objective news out there or that it's not the ideal that new, some news organizations are striving for. It's that people uh, have lost trust uh, and people need, as I said, to be able to do a little bit of work to figure out what are the, uh, the good news sources. When the news is bifurcated into you know, different partisan outlets, we, we really uh, don't, don't know what to believe, uh, that can be a problem. Um, there's, there's fake news, there's spin, there's bias. Um, how, how do we know what the objective sources are? Sometimes the media don't help because I think there's actually such a thing as objectivity bias, which is when they think that in order to show that they're not biased, they have to present two sides of a point of view. Exactly. Even if one of them is a lie. Yes. That's not, that's not exactly. real objectivity. Mm -hmm. the, the media should be, their job is to tell the truth. Not to tell, uh, not to give somebody who's a liar equal time. Yes. Yeah, so, for example, uh, having someone um, a debate between someone who is a climate denier and someone who is a uh, um, environmentalist. Yeah. That's not a, a real debate no. because there is no, there's only no. one truth in there. No, they're, they're giving a platform for people who have a, a political agenda. Yeah. Uh, it would be as if. Uh, going back to the tobacco lobby, that they didn't have to buy the advertisements, they just bullied their way onto cable news and could, uh, could talk about it. Yeah. Uh, there, there's one uh, important quotation here, I can't remember who said it, um, but it's that the halfway point between truth and a lie is still a lie. <laughs> Interesting. So uh, this is uh, New England Authors. Uh, we're so good to, ha to have uh, Lee McIntyre uh, with us, who's talk we're talking about truth and uh, the denial of truth. And, and um, I want to ask you, you didn't talk about uh, religion in your book or fundamentalism mm -hmm. pur purposely? Well, uh, the, the book was, uh, my charge in writing this book was to talk specifically about the roots of post-truth. Um, and I did say a little bit about fundamentalist uh, religion in respecting truth, mm -hmm. because I think that uh, there I talk about how ideology can be the enemy of truth, and I think that political bias uh, is, or political ideology is one type of ideology, but religious ideology can be another. Um, when one's talking about political ideology, I think that there's a sense that sometimes it's it's more cynical, that maybe the folks don't really believe it, but they want to present it as true in order to get other partisans on their side. I would hope that that's not true with people who are religious. I think that they're, they probably genuinely uh, believe what they believe. Yeah. It can still, however, lead to problems um, with denial. Uh, the example that springs to mind here is evolution by natural selection. 
Um, there are empirical questions that deserve a scientific answer, but if someone comes at it from a religious point of view, they're not going to get to that answer, and they might even be tempted to be a denialist uh, about that, as some folks are about evolution by natural selection. Thank you. Okay. I, I have a couple of quotes I'd like you to, to uh, comment on. What is striking about the idea of post-truth is not just that truth is being challenged, but that it is being challenged as a mechanism for asserting political dominance. Could you comment? That, that's the dark underbelly of post-truth. I, I just want to ask, uh, um, we know that post-truth uh, is really good for authoritarian, uh, country, authoritarian people. Is it also uh, good for businesses like, um, like the oil businesses or um, uh, uh, Fox News? But post-truth is, a, uh, is a, a means, it's a tactic that can be used by people for different purposes. It can be used for political purposes. It can also be used for commercial purposes. Um, fake news really started from people who were creating clickbait uh, so that if you clicked on their uh, fake stories, they would make a, a few cents for each one. Then it was weaponized and it became more political. But uh, it's very short-sighted to think of it that way because I think that the long-term damage of creating a post-truth society is really incalculable. Terrific.